Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, the podcast for the Narrative Lectionary, with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Christopher Fan Kaufman. Today we're talking about Ezra 1, 1 through 4, 3, 1 through 4, and 10 through 13. It's a little bit of a cut up lesson here. And this is the reading for the third Sunday in Advent, which this year is December 17th, 2023. Now, Ezra may be a book you're not very familiar with. It's one of those that doesn't get as much um, doesn't get as much play in our readings, and so I'm glad that we've included it in the narrative here. So just to set it up, we talked in the last two weeks about these two prophets, Jeremiah and Isaiah. And one of the things that Jeremiah and Isaiah are prophesying and are warning about is the coming exile of the people. And what it is is that the leaders of Jerusalem and the elites of the city are taken by the Babylonians into exile. They're forcibly removed from their homes and their nation and forced to live somewhere else. And Ezra tells a story several generations later of the people who get to go back and who come back to the city of Jerusalem, which their ancestors left behind, and the reactions that uh, greets them as people, both their own personal reactions, but then the reactions of the people who weren't taken into exile. It's a complicated book, so mm -hmm. I don't don't downplay that complicatedness. And uh, I appreciate that um, we are including this because sometimes it's we need a lack of familiarity when we read God's word. Um, sometimes we need to come into it fresh, and uh, then it becomes a living word again. Um, and we've said this the last couple of weeks, that these, these prophetic voices actually speak into our time, which is uh, very much a time of displacement, a time of the things that um, we had built our hope on seems to uh, be failing us, um, the fragility of uh, our efforts. And um, in this particular case with, with Ezra, uh, as we move quickly through, through this little book, um, folks are forcibly removed and not able to live the way that they're uh, used to living. They're not able to practice um, um, their, their traditions, their values. Um, they are truly going to need to be a countercultural people. And so those folks that are coming back have to meet with that first, coming back to where they can be who they are, coming back to where it's suspicious as to whether or not they will be faithful, and then also coming back to folks who, you know, if you really think about it, don't fully understand the experience that they've had. And yet this word is speaking to all of them to form again a faithful glimpse of the goodness and righteousness of God. This is a needed word for us to hear today. Yeah, that's really great. And I really love that point you just made about one of the things that makes Ezra hard to read, but also that makes it a valuable book for us, is that we have these two groups of people who have both had traumatic experiences. One who's been taken away from the land of Judah into exile, the other who's had to stay and suffer through what it's like to live in a war-torn, yeah. desolated country. And now they've come back together and they don't see eye to eye. And neither of them is totally right and neither of them is totally wrong. And the, the negotiations and the learning to live together mm -hmm. is something that we can learn from this book mm -hmm. and that we can keep in mind in this book. And so, again, it's one of those where you may not think right away that that sort of experience is in the biblical text, if you've only read the stories that kind of come up over and over again. And so I really, I'm really glad that you pointed out, sometimes we need to read that book that we've never thought of, or we've never dove into, and that helps us to actually hear the word again. And, and to read it with both audiences in mind. Yeah. Because both of these are the people of God. Mm -hmm. They are the, the descendants of the promise. Mm -hmm. um, but they have had very different post-war experiences. One of the things I meant to say as we began um, is this is set in a particular time. 
Um, so it's a marker of time that um, archaeologists are still trying to figure out if, you know, if, if it's valid. But the times that are given as we read the text, let us know that there, there are events and leaders that if you drop their name or if you mention this event, automatically people who know their history and their story will immediately know what they're talking about. Yep. So even if we you know, can quibble over the accuracy, the point that the text is making is you remember this king, you remember these events, and okay, I say 9-11, you know what I'm talking about. Yep. You know, I say, you know, um, oh gosh, um, I forgot what the date was. Uh, I was trying to uh, do, um, uh, uh, help me out with uh, the um, um, uh, V Day. Um, oh, June 6th. No, oh, no V Day, so November 11th is November 11th. That's Veterans Day coming up. Veterans which Day. Is... Isn't there a December date though? Well, you're talking about Pearl Harbor Day. Is Pearl the, Harbor, that one. Yeah, okay, now I'm embarrassed because it took me that long to get there. But, I, we're, you know, we're in December. I thought I should call out something. That was mm -hmm. No, but I think that's really important, too, because it gets to that that point that we're making is that it's, it's a signal to the people who lived through it in the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, just as you're saying, it's a signal if we talk about 9-11. One of the things my dad talks about sometimes, where were you when President Kennedy was assassinated yes. or when Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated? These are days that people remember. But it's also, it's a little bit of a warning to us mm -hmm. in that if you weren't there when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, you may not understand what it was like to live through it. And so this book of Ezra is telling us for those who do remember what the first year of King Cyrus of Persia was like, this you know it's taking you back there. But for those of us who don't, we have to be careful. We have to ask ourselves, what was it like? And not to assume immediately that we can place ourselves in these people's shoes. So I think that's a really important thing. Because as we think of it, we know that this is a word for us too. Hmm. But it's a word for us in a different way than it was a word for them. And it's in thinking about the differences between their time and our time and between what they experienced and what we experienced that we start to understand how it is a word for us, what it's saying for us here. In that we're reading this as a narrative, the lectionary to pull us all the way through, to thread through, um, it, and we're choosing the text um, in some ways to fill in the gaps of what our familiarity has left out. Um, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm teaching uh, uh, Bible right now. And one of the things that I try to get my students to understand is when we read, um, when we're reading um, biology, we know we don't, you know, a college student knows that they don't understand biology. High school biology was hard and I'm pre-med and I've really got to get this hard <laughs> stuff. So you go in reading, even if they're saying, Things in biology, you know, I've heard of photosynthesis, you know, mm -hmm. you go in with the familiarity, but you go in saying, I don't know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And that's the way we need to read these texts. They are written for us, but we cannot assume we know what they're talking about unless we deeply reflect on the entire events that are happening and to be able to, to recognize that each moment, each episode is there to build for us why this word of warning or this word of promise is so important then and therefore now. Because for us now, it shows the faithfulness of God. And if God could be, if God could be um, present hope for them in the midst of this distress and division, oh my goodness, in the 21st century, can't we use a God who can stand between our divides and Amen. form a people in community? Amen. We definitely can. And I, I think one of the things to be aware of when you're reading Ezra, and especially when you're reading this particular text, especially at the end, kind of 10 through 13, I want you to think about your people 
the people you're preaching to, and the places in their lives where, as it says in 312, it's such a visceral scene. Mm. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of families, old people who had seen the first house, that's the temple, on its foundations, wept with a loud voice when they saw this house. Where are those places in your community that people who will look at and weep, people who knew what it looked like at an earlier time? Because these are the sorts of things, again, that we say God spoke and God was there at that time, and God speaks and is there in our time too, because we experience these same things. And so I invite you to reflect on the, that as well. Maybe you've never been, I've never been, to see the Western Wall in Jerusalem, to see the foundations of the temple. But you don't have to go there to see places that'll cause people to weep. And it's an interesting word. Otis Moss um, drew my attention to this. No, no, it wasn't. It was uh, Cynthia uh, Wilson uh, who brought, brought, brought this word uh, um, where it reads um, in verse 13 following that. So verse 12, uh, um, they wept with a loud voice when they saw this house, though many shouted aloud with joy. So I'll pause there and say, they're getting this foundation, the, the recovery of what has been lost. The temple had been destroyed. That was part of their trauma. Uh, that was part of the loss of those who were taken away. And they knew that their place was gone, even though they couldn't see it. And the trauma of those who remained, who could walk by that shell and see it every day. And now, they're able to lay a new foundation, and some are weeping in a loud voice in sorrow, and some are shouting with joy. But in verse 13, it says, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted so loudly that the sound was heard from afar away. I think we might need to pay attention to that as well, because some of the chatter that we're hearing right now at first glimpse might sound like a victory cry when actually it is a cry for help. Mm -hmm. And some of the sounds that we're hearing that sound like their lament might in fact be someone calling out in their might or assumed might and power. Mm -hmm. And it's important for us as listeners to be able to say, if I'm going to build a bridge across those divides, I can't assume what I'm hearing. Uh, I've got to stop and listen and make sure that what I'm hearing is what the voice is actually conveying. Otherwise my response could be off. Yeah, that's beautiful. 